morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, today, we're going to be covering what's new in Global Mapper 22.1. Uh, my name is Katrina Schweikert. I'm a product manager here at Blue Marble Geographics. And I am joined today by my colleague, Amanda Lind. How are you doing, Amanda? Hi, Katrina. I'm doing really well. It's another sunny day in Maine. This is, I think, one of your first webinars for us. So welcome, welcome to the family of live broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, it's good to be here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the format. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit how the webinar works today? Absolutely. So this session is being recorded and it will be posted on Blue Marble's website within a couple of days. You can find a link to it there. And just a reminder, all webinar attendees are in listen only mode. So you can hear Katrina and I, but we won't be able to hear you. So if you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the chat on the right side of your screen. Katrina and I will try to answer these through text and if you verbally as we can throughout the webinar. Any questions that aren't answered, you will receive an answer from email later. If you're watching this from the recording, feel free to email geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com and me or another tech support specialist will get back to you. Yeah, and we'll show that email at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and also just a reminder, it's the questions panel that that you want to use um, to ask those questions. We will be keeping an eye on that. Thank you. So, so before we get started, um, a little bit about what else we have coming up in the future here. Um, we do these geo talks uh, sessions on a pretty regular basis. Um, this release, we did decide to separate um, what's new in Global Mapper and what's new in the LiDAR module. So next week we'll be covering a lot of the new LiDAR functionality, which includes um, lots of exciting things, terrain painting, new LiDAR updates, um, new building extraction updates, all, all sorts of different things. So um, I encourage you to sign up and stay tuned for that um, same, same time next week. Um, you can register for that on our website. Um, some other webinars we have coming up March 17th is Managing 3D Coordinate Systems in Global Mapper and Geographic Calculator. Um, so if you need to do kind of advanced geodetic work, um, you know, if you Maybe you're a surveyor, or maybe you just need to manage, you know, different coordinate systems and make sure you're maintaining your precision. We're going to be covering all sorts of detailed information about how you can do that um, with our tools. On April 21st, we'll be covering accessing free online data in Global Mapper. This is a really popular functionality. Um, we've built in a lot of pre-built sources, um, and we'll just go over in detail um, different ways of accessing free data. And May 19th, we'll be talking about working with raster data in Global Mapper. Um, so lots of different things that we can do with imagery um, and other types of raster data, like palette layers, like land cover. Um, so we'll cover lots of different analysis methods for those as well. So if those sound interesting to you, you can sign up on our website, um, bluemarblegeo.com slash geotalksexpress. So that's what we have coming up. So to today, today we're going to be covering, um, first we'll talk about a recap of, you know, what, what we've covered in other recent releases in 22 and um, other recent times, just to make sure everyone knows about some of our new features. Um, in terms of our latest features, we'll be looking at um, some new 3D functionality. One of these is saving views in 3D. So this is a, the ability to quickly um, navigate to a particular orientation in 3D, and you can also save a custom view. So if you want to remember a particular location in the data set, looking at a particular orientation, um, you can create a custom view for that, and that will save in the workspace. So Amanda's going to be showing us that. Um, also camera targeting, you can see that screenshot on the right. So we've made it a lot easier to um, sort of locate that pivot access for the 3D inside of your area of interest. Um, so kind of snap it to a feature that is selected, or a set of features, or a location on the terrain, um, and you can sort of lock that pivot access and it also allows you to zoom in even closer than you could previously to kind of really focus on that one particular feature or set of features of interest. So that is called um, camera targeting. Uh, it's controlled by um, keyboard shortcuts, but it really lets you um, kind of improve your navigation. Then we'll be moving on to looking at um, some improvements in the graphing and charting tool. Um, you know, so partly with the enhanced use of things like um, COVID data in GIS, obviously. Um, new types of data are becoming incredibly pre prevalent in terms of, um, you know, wanting to do both the spatial analysis and also some increased graphing and charting. Um, so we've really expanded the tools to allow to do that. Um, so 
things like multiple series um, and adding multiple layers into a graph. Um, so we support bar graphs and line charts and pie graphs, and we'll take a look at some ways that you can kind of create more advanced uh, charts so you don't have to leave your GIS software. You can do it right in there and take a look at those attributes in that graphical interface. Um, Amanda's going to be showing us some additional spatial operations that have been added. Um, so spatial operations are operations that can do um, overlay of two different area geometries, um, sets of geometries, or query of them, so spatial querying and um, spatial operations like intersection, which was introduced in the last release. Um, we have a whole new set of features, union, um, difference, symmetrical difference, as well as some query predicates like um, intersect, uh, disjoint. Um, so we'll cover all of those new options. There's also a new scripting interface for that, so you can include some of these queries in um, either a scripting, kind of advanced scripting dialogue inside of the interface or in the scripting language if you want to script some of that, um, you know, vector querying and vector editing. So I know that's been a, a long time request and we're continuing to uh, build that out. We also have made a number of customer requested improvements in the path profile tool. Um, so customizing the horizontal and vertical scale is one thing that we'll take a look at. Um, also, uh, exporting the cross profile series. So if you create, if you have created a perpendicular profile and generated many cross profiles, um, we have a new operation that will just export those all as one. So for example, you can create a multi-page PDF that just has each profile um, or a DXF, you know, lots of formats you can export to that might be relevant for your workflow. Um, a couple of other features that we'll cover, um, changing the layer background in the control center. So, you know, we have a lot of users that maybe share workspaces throughout their team. Um, and we've learned we have a lot of users that have quite large workspaces with lots of layers. So um, this is just a usability enhancement um, that lets you sort of flag or highlight particular layers just in the control center. So you, you can um, you know, easily identify them or, or cue somebody else into which layers they, should, they might need to be looking at or editing. So that is one addition in this release. And also featured templates. So featured templates let you um, set up a sort of schema for data collection, whether you want to do that in Global Mapper or maybe send it to Global Mapper Mobile and have people collect data in the field. Um, and we've included the ability to set up predefined styles um, there as well. So if you want to, um, we'll, we'll take a look at a, an example that does a tree inventory and will style based on a particular attribute, which is whether the trees are deciduous or evergreen. Um, and we'll use the point icon that kind of shows that on the map automatically. So that's just one example of how you might want to include styles, um, especially if you are working on the mobile device. Um, it's nice to be able to collect that data and have it sort of automatically styled based on the attributes that you've chosen. Um, and uh, the last one on this list, um, a new option in info tips for looking at the elevation neighborhood. Um, this was partly developed in conjunction with the terrain painting tool. So if you are using terrain painting in the ladder module to modify your terrain, um, but there are other applications for this as well. It's just nice to look at um, not just the pixel information exactly where your cursor is, but actually the surrounding pixels as well. So we can now show that information um, sort of the, the neighborhood of pixels around where your cursor is to sort of see what's going on um, in the raw data. Um, and if we have time, we'll cover lots of other new, um, new tools that have been added. Um, so that's what we have on the agenda for today. Um, before we take a look at those, let's do a little recap of some of the other recent improvements that we've had. Um, so if you haven't watched some of our recent videos, um, in, in the last couple of releases, um, we've introduced iDome Lighting, um, which is an exciting new visualization in 3D that really lets you see depth. You can kind of see this in the, um, in the window on the right, although not quite as exaggerated, but you'll notice that um, you know, our edges of that sort of river cliff there are a little bit um, shaded. So it really lets you point, pick out um, the kind of depth within the scene by adding that sort of hill shade, shading backdrop to features that are in the middle ground. So that's eye dome lighting. Um, other 3D improvements as well, things like sweep selection of features. 
um, an exciting one that was introduced in the in the last release that I know um, has a lot of applications is um, mesh and tin simplification. So the ability to take that detailed mesh or that detailed tin that maybe you've generated from pixels to points, or maybe you have a, a DXF mesh and you want to simplify an area. So to cut down on the number of triangles that are in an area that is quite flat. Um, so we have introduced simplification and that obviously pays attention to you know, trying to preserve as much detail as possible while minimizing the size. Um, another recent addition, um, which I think they'll probably cover in the, the raster webinar coming up, is raster reclassification. Um, so if you do work with raster data or, or terrain or imagery, and you want to do um, you know, specific classification, um, you know, change existing classes, or maybe uh, classify something like terrain data into different categories. Um, you can do that with the rest of reclassification to the now. Um, so that was another recent addition. Um, so let's get started with looking at some of our new features. Um, we're going to start with looking at the 3D improvements. Um, and Amanda, I'm going to go ahead and let you show us that. So just switch the screen here, and we have a lot of exciting things to show that have been improvements in the 3D viewer. Absolutely. Can you see my screen? I can, yep. Great. Glad to hear it. All right. There are two new tools we'd like to show you within the 3D viewer. Um, the first is the ability to save 3D views. Now, we've always been able to save views in 2D viewer by using these tools in the view option, but now we can do this within the 3D view. So we have these options here that are not new. You can view from your data from the top, from the underneath, from the south, from the east. But now you have the ability to save the new view. So if you find, if I turn off my digitizer, you can navigate to an area of the data. Maybe you're about to build a building and you would like to see what the view is. Anyway, you find the perfect view. When you want to save this, you can navigate to it later without having to struggle. You can hit Save New View. Name it however you would like. And no matter where you end up, you can always go back to your saved view, and there you are. Now to delete that view, you go to View Management, easy peasy, delete it, click Yes, and you're good to go, and you can create as many as you want to. Now, yeah, say, say you're focusing on a mountain, another cool thing that you can do is the ability to have camera targeting. So we have the pivot access tool here and it shows you where the center of your screen is, where you pan, where you scroll. And you can focus that by clicking, pressing the Z key and that focuses camera targeting. You can also use, use the select tool if you have vector features. You can select it and that will focus, <laughs> it will focus the pivot tool over there. You can also select multiple vector features, which I don't have here, and the pivot tool will center between all of them. And it will be locked to that view, but you can still use the mouse wheel to pan around and to kind of alter it and adjust it as you will. But still, as you navigate, that's where it will stay. And those are the two new 3D viewer tools, or two of them at least. That's great. So, um, so you don't necessarily have to turn on that pivot access. That's just sort of for demonstration. But basically, it's locking until you intentionally pan. It will lock the view on that either that location in the train of interest or your set of selected features. Um, that's using the Z key. We also have a question about um, saving the view as a JPEG. Um, so we already have that ability within the 3D viewer there, that very last button on the toolbar um, will save a 3D image. So if you did have a, a particular orientation set up, you can go ahead and export that right out to um, an image format that you want to. Um, yep, and you saw in the view menu there that um, this particular custom view that you're saving is specific to the workspace. And um, so you want to save that workspace to remember that location. Great. Um, so we're going to take a look now at some graphing and charting tools. I'm going to grab the screen back here. Um, 
So we've made additionally some improvements to graphing and charting. The first example that I want to show you um, is just some COVID data for the, the state where our office is. We have been sort of collecting this as, as the data comes in um, week by week, and I just have a subset of that from April 2020. Um, you know, so it, it might be common here to have attributes that you want to graph. In this case, it's um, sort of changes over time, and I have set up my data so that each layer represents its own timestamp. Um, and they all have the same attribute. Um, so that is gonna allow me to create this, this graph that shows um, sort of change across multiple layers. So I'm gonna go to the analysis menu here and go to the graph and chart manager. Um, let's go ahead and build a new graph here. So I like to start on the data series tab before I make my title here, just to kind of take a look at what I'm doing. Um, so I'm going to make a line graph. I want to see change over time um, throughout each county, and I have statistics from each county. Um, so you'll see the option now to add multiple layers, and I want to use all my loaded layers in this case, so I'm just going to include all of them. So now I need to set up my X and Y axis, and optionally also this new multiple series option, so I can have multiple lines. Um, so in this case, my x-axis is the date um, that the data was collected. So I'm going to use the layer name, which contains that date information to kind of look at how my layers have been set up here. The value that I want to map, this is, again, COVID case information. Um, so I'm going to map the um, confirmed positive cases across time here. Um, and lastly, I want to look at this by geographic region. So the name of each county is just listed here as name. And let's go ahead and turn off the labels here so we can get a better look. Um, so you can see now with multiple series, I've created sort of this change over time. Let's orient our x-axis labels here so we can read them a bit better. Um, my Each um, instance here on the x-axis, because I'm using the layer name, um, is showing me the date information. So you'll need to name your layers by whatever you want that x-axis to show. And those are getting sorted um, based on their values. Um, so, so they are getting pro properly ordered um, based on their, their alphanumeric sort. Um, lastly here, I want to make a couple adjustments so I can change the access information here. I might want to label this as cases, et cetera. Um, because I already have set up my, my map here to have colors, unique colors for each county, I can also match my features here to the colors that I've already used. Um, so that creates a nice correlation between what I'm seeing on my map and what's on the graph. Um, you can also just use the built-in colors as well. And lastly, I just need to create a title here. So this is COVID, this is in April 2020. Um, so really an expansion here to allow you to do that sort of basic graphing and charting right within the application. Um, I can dock that uh, right next to my map data. Um, obviously, in, in this particular case, my map data is not showing too much information, just the correlation, but it's still a nice visualization here um, to be able to do that right inside of the GIS software. Um, so the multiple series attribute is what, what's creating each of those separate lines. Um, and we're also using multiple layers here to, to map the same attribute um, across time. Um, a couple of other examples that I will show you quickly here um, that I've, that I've pre-built. Um, just using the, um, the built-in data here, so you can actually reproduce this if you want to. This is the default data in Global Mapper. Um, so these numbers are a bit out of date, but just to show an easy example here. Um, so I, again, I've colored my area features here by continent and then used those same colors within these two different graphs here. And um, let's take a look at how uh, some of these graphs are set up. So I'm going to go into the properties here. Um, so this is, again, using things like multiple series. Um, so in this case, I'm looking at just one layer, which is countries. I'm labeling by the income group. So this is a particular attribute within the data. The value that I'm showing is the um, GDP estimate. Um, I can choose my aggregation method. So this is also a new attribute here. So instead of maybe the sum, the total GDP for each of these, I'm, I'm taking the average in this case. That's what I'm interested in this time. 
And then I'm adding an additional layer of grouping. So with the bar chart, this is what creates that multiple bars. So each continent has its own bar within the income group. Um, and that's creating the multiple bars. And again, I can match that to my associated features here. Um, sort of the last step. So um, with bar graphs as well, we have this mul multiple series that can be added and also the aggregation method um, that can be adjusted depending on exactly what you want to show on your graph. Um, I just show this one more example here. So this is um, a line graph doing similar information here. So again, we're just using one layer in this case. Taking a look again at the income group, um, and we've split it by continent as well. So with the line graph, that multiple series attribute is going to give you multiple lines, one for each of the unique values um, within that attribute. So I'm getting a line for each continent. And because my attributes are colored based on continent, I can use that color in my graph as well if I want to. So those are some new improvements to graphing and charting, trying to make it easier to just visualize data quickly. Um, within Global Mapper instead of having to go out to something like Excel. Um, so we have a question about um, exporting to Excel. So um, what I'm graphing is the attributes of the data. Um, we don't have a way to export directly from the graph tool to a spreadsheet, um, but I can always um, export the table. So I would just go into Edit Attributes, and from here I can pick which attributes and and export this out, um, either set of selected features or um, all of the features, and I can export that to a CSV or Excel, Excel file. So you could definitely do it that way to get the same values and reproduce that graph if you wanted to. You can also um, you know, save this graph itself out to an image file. <clears throat> so if you wanted to embed it in a report um, just directly as it is, that's also an option. So let's jump back to our PowerPoint here. Um, so next, we're going to take a look at um, some spatial operations. Um, so Amanda, do you want to show us um, what's been added to the spatial operations tool? Absolutely. We've added quite a few new features. Let me show my screen here. All right, so what I'm going to be using to demonstrate these features is a parcels layer of New York City. If you're familiar with the area, this is Central Park, and this is Rikers Island. I'm from Oklahoma, so I had to look these up, not necessarily Central Park, but it's always good to know. And this is a FEMA flood hazard map, just to show the areas that are at hazard of flooding and should probably get flood insurance. But we're going to look at exactly which parcels layer within this by using the spatial operations tool that's up here on the analysis toolbar. Those of you who have been using version 22.0 know that the spatial operations tool is new, but what is new for version 22.1 is every tool except the intersection tool. Now, as a recap for version 22.0, the intersection tool takes the two layers that you have selected here, and it creates a new layer just containing the layers that overlap. So it cuts away all this stuff here and all this stuff here that doesn't overlap with the other layer. Now, what we can do with version 22.1, I'm not going to do all of these because that would take a lot of time, but I'll show you a few of them and I'll describe others. Union is basically what it sounds. It creates one single layer with the totality of the other two layers. It doesn't cut, it just merges into one file, but it also keeps the color classifications. Something else that I should mention is that spatial operations currently only works for area features, so not points or lines yet. We'll work on that in the future. Difference is basically the opposite of union, where the new layer has is subtracted of the overlapping features. So you'll just have the layers that don't overlap, but they'll still be together in the same layer. Now, intersects is different from intersection because it creates layers. You, you can choose which layer you want to keep. Because with, with intersection, remember, it's both layers together. But with intersects, I'll show you here. Say we just wanted to know the information about these uh, parcel layers here. We didn't really want to keep this flood map. So we'll ch set the parcels as our first layer. The flood ma map is our second layer. I'm going to label this as intersects. And then we will hit run. Yeah, so this would be, you might be asking the question, you know, which parcels are affected by this new flood zone? And, and you want, as your output, the full original parcels. You don't want to chop them up to just have the area that will be flooded, but you want the full initial parcel. So that's what 
the intersex operation is going to do. It's going to return the parcels that have some intersection with the flood zone, um, but you'll get them in their original form. Exactly. And it also takes the attributes of the original parcel data. So you have all of that information here to do with as you will. Now the next tool we can look at is overlaps. It's very similar to contains and within, so we'll go through those. But overlaps is where they overlap boundaries, not necessarily that they just overlap lines, like touches is if they share a boundary, but they don't necessarily overlap area that would show up in the touches. But with overlaps in this situation, it will be areas that are partially flooded. So also something important to know, if you can't find your layer in here, there's a chance it's because it isn't turned on over here in the side. Quick tip. Okay. But I want to look in the New York parcels. I want to cut it down by flood hazard. I'm going to label that overlaps. And hit so this run. should be probably a pretty similar result, but we are cutting out any parcel that maybe just happens to have one corner touching the very edge of the flood boundary. So it's including things that are they have full or partial flooding so that the you know the water part of the flooding not the edge of the flooding is actually um, touching the inside of the parcel um, so that's a slight difference you know, between there and intersex is pretty broad it, it just grabs everything that has any kind of touching or overlapping relationship yeah intersecting is our, our broadest tool here and you can see the difference between the two layers i'm going to go ahead and turn that off and turn these two back on and the next is within now within is the return set of features that are wholly contained by features in another set. So this will be parcels that are completely flooded. There are parcels, New York parcels that are completely within flood hazard. So we'll relabel that, hit run, pull this to the side, and then we can see what within looks like. And these are just the parcels here that absolutely have to have flood insurance <laughs> if we're going through that. They're completely contained. Now, the opposite of within is contains, and that's going to be flood hazard that is completely contained by the New York parcels here. And this is a much smaller result, you'll see. It's just Rikers Island over here. Now, if we look at why that is, it's because there's one, let's see if I can click on it. There's one little flood hazard area that's completely contained by Rikers Island, and all of the other flood hazards area are not contained. Yeah, maybe a little less applicable to this data, but you can see how, how that might be um, what you're interested in. Yeah. Now, there is a way to automate this. Say you are only interested in parcels that are within a certain zip code, and that zip code information is within the parcels attribute data. You could do this manually by going through the ve vector search feature and selecting them, or you can do it in one step by using scripting. And this is an example we've brought up here where we've chosen the layer, where, and then we've said the zip code, which is the name of the attribute equals, we're gonna look at zip code 10029. So we'll say the layer intersects is what we're looking for. NYC, which we labeled up here, flood hazard map. And then once it's been created, we wanna go ahead and select the flooded zip code. I'm going to go ahead and hit run. And then we can see that it's selected all of the new features that have been exported. Yeah, so we built sort of a temporary set. That's what's happening in that first line. There's a, a temporary set called NYC that is based on an attribute query where the zip code has a particular attribute value. Um, and, and then we're doing that intersect operation and, and reporting that output to a new layer called flooded uh, 10029. Um, and then that last step is also an option you can do with scripting, which is, um, you know, selecting or highlighting that feature with the digitizer tool um, and kind of pushing that back to the workspace. Um, this can also be used, um, you know, the same syntax kind of wrapped inside of a command can be used within the scripting language. Um, obviously, the selection is only relevant if, you if you're running the script in the context of a workspace. Um, but so things like building temporary subsets of your vector data. Um, you know, and then doing these kind of query or um, cutting operations on them. Um, this is really some very powerful um, functionality that we started to open up here um, to do this kind of vector, um, vector analysis. So thanks for showing us that. Um, we have a question of 
about the scripting language that Global Mapper uses. Um, so we do have our own scripting language. It's called Global Mapper Script. Um, it's pretty easy to pick up. Uh, you can take a look at our scripting reference. Um, it just uses um, you know commands and parameters that sort of mimic what is used in the tool set. Um, so just automating that can be run through uh, the command line or through a batch script, um, as well as run from within the interface of Global Mapper. Um, we have lots of videos covering um, you know advanced topics on scripting as well. So um, there's lots of resources out there for that. So let's move on here. I'm going to go ahead and take the screen back. <clears throat> um, so next, we're going to take a look at some new options in the Path Profile tool. And I have a workspace here. Um, just with some terrain data loaded, um, this particular area happens to have, you can see sort of in the river, a couple of um, dam features here. Um, but just terrain data. Um, I'm going to use our profile tool. So right in the toolbar um, and just draw a profile across my data set here. Um, so the profile tool is um, very powerful. Uh, one of our commonly used features here for um, kind of interrogating your data and looking at it in that cross profile view. Um, what we've added is some customization options. Um, let's start with customizing the, um, the scales within my profile. I'm gonna open the options for the path profile here. Um, and you'll notice a couple of new settings here. Um, so one requested feature here is to control this, um, this access or the distance scale within my profile. Um, so in the past, this was auto-generated and it was based on the unit that you have set for your global, um, in, your, in, your, in your configuration, in your program settings right now, I'm set to meters. Um, but we had a lot of requests to customize that within the interface here. So. You know, say for this particular data, I just want to quickly change this graph to heat, and I want to customize the interval here. So just looking at my kind of distance range here, let's say I want to, I want a little distance tick mark every 20 feet here. So that's going to automatically change that unit. Um, you can also change the starting distance. So for example, if you have maybe a linear referencing system, you know, maybe I'm looking along a utility corridor or a road, and I, I want to start at a particular um, starting marker that is not zero, I can customize that as well. So you know, maybe I want to start at 100 because I'm looking at a, a section of a larger profile or I don't know, there's, there's, there's reasons that you might want to customize that. So we have um, introduced the option to do that. Um, you can always default that back to zero, um, which is kind of a, a standard starting uh, tick mark there. You can also customize the vertical scale now. Um, so my units are set here. Um, I could also put that in feet here. Um, I would just, as a caution, if you are working in um, statute units a lot, um, it's definitely worth changing your measurement settings and the configuration to statute um, so that that just defaults a lot of different places. Um, but mine is in meters right now. And just as an example, I'm, I'm changing everything to feet just within path profile. Um, so I might want to customize the elevation scale spacing here. Um, so instead of letting it kind of default build this, let's do this also at every 20 feet. Um, and you'll see that that has customized those um, lines going across my data as well as the, the tick marks for my vertical scale there. Um, lots of other customization that you can do that's not new. We can you know customize what our um, range is here in the vertical access if you want to have it start and stop at particular values. Otherwise, it's just deriving it from my data that I've profiled. Um, I also want to show you another new feature in Path Profile, which has to do with perpendicular profiles. Um, so lots of customization options here for the graph and chart, but let's take a look at um, cross profiles as well. So I'm going to make a new line here just for a little bit more interesting of data. Um, I want to go sort of along this stream section because we're actually going to generate cross profiles, um, sort of transects across the stream here. Um, so to enable this, I want to go into the settings and turn on perpendicular profiles here. I can determine what that swath width is, so how far across I'm going to go. I'm just going to use 150 meters for that. And let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like. So rather than going along the length of the stream, um, I'm instead doing a cross-act of the stream, 
and looking at particular sections. And I can move down that. Um, there are settings that control this, how often you move. Um, so this is not a new tool. We've had this for a while. Um, and it's a very popular tool. What we did introduce this time is the ability to export this um, directly. So this is, we've called this save cross profile series. Um, so now I have, um, you know, based on the default settings, basically 30 transects across my stream here. Um, and now I want to just export that out to a file. So I'm going to save a new cross profile series. Um, in this particular case, just for ease of showing, I'm going to create a PDF. Um, and I like the uh, multi-page PDF, so just one document that has a page for each of these cross profiles. Um, so that's what I'm going to generate here. And I'll just put it on my desktop here. I can control my settings here. I like doing these cross profiles in landscape mode if you're not going to add any other data to your PDF. Um, they do tend to be a bit wider than they, all, than they are tall. So this is going to generate a 30 page PDF. This is going to take just a minute to generate. Um, I see we have a couple of questions coming in as we're waiting for this to finish exporting here. Um, so is it possible to export the cross profile lines shown in plan view? Um, yes, so you can save the profile lines to a vector layer. So these options are not new. They have been slightly renamed. Um, but you can save that path to a new layer. So that can include the cross profiles. Um, so if you want to export all of these, all cross profiles, it'll make a new layer and you can actually see where each of those transects is um, within my data here. Um, so yes, that is, that is an option. Um, and we're actually seeing, seeing those on my graph as well right now. Um, let's go ahead and open the output here that was generated. Um, so, you know, I can customize the font and the coloring. I haven't done any of that customization, but just using the defaults here. Um, so I've created this multi-page PDF and each page has one of those cross profile sections. So you'll get similar results for, um, you know, creating an, an image if you want to, you know, make your own report or um, a DXF as well. If you want to go out to CAD software or some other software, you can create this graph um, in, in any of those formats and it will generate in one go, each of those profiles. Um, let's see, Amanda, have you had a chance to look at any of these other questions? Is there anything else that I should address right now? I think you've done all the ones we can demonstrate. I see a few questions about licensing. Um, there's a question about animating the cross sections, which is on our list, but we haven't put that out quite yet. Yeah, so you can control with the uh, um, either the arrow buttons here or um, your keyboard arrows, um, but we haven't had a way to sort of loop through that and save it. You could certainly screen record and save it to a video if you wanted to, um, but we haven't added a direct export for that yet. Um, there's also a question about um, cross profile being associated with vertices along the line of a section. So yes, so um, I just used the default here. Um, if we go into uh, actually, let's just do it from here. This is the easiest way to get to it. So if I go to the configuration, um, this perpendicular sampling is controlling where those cross profiles are generated. I just stuck with a default, which is 30 across the length, but you can customize that. So every particular distance interval or at your existing vertices, um, those are definitely options. Um, or you know, if you just want to sample a certain number along the length of your entire line, you can do that as well. You can also generate this from an existing line feature, so you don't have to draw a new profile, I can highlight an existing vector feature and generate a profile off of that as well, um, either along its length or um, like I did here, turn it into perpendicular mode, um, kind of across that line feature. Um, great, so those are some exciting new options. This is um, a pretty cool tool that has lots of applications. Um, you know, I can also show vector features. If you're a LiDAR module user, you can show the LiDAR data as well um, within that cross profile. So lots of options there. Let's take a look back at our agenda here. Um, so the next thing that we're going to cover is um, changing the background in the control center. Um, Amanda, can you show us how that works? Absolutely. Thanks for showing the path profile bit. That's always one of our favorite user tools. Okay, so to highlight the background in the control center, I'm just going to use the same data set we have been using. It's, as Katrina said earlier, it's useful for differentiating 
layers, especially if you're working with many layers or you're sharing the workspace, you can select one or multiple, however you'd like, whichever you want. Hit layer and then select background color for label and control center. You can select one or many. I'm gonna go ahead and hit both of these since those are our primary. And you can choose whichever color you want. It's a, it's a familiar dialogue you've probably seen elsewhere in the software. You hit okay. And then both of these are highlighted. Then to unhighlight them, is the same way, we just set it to white. So you go to layer, background color, click OK, set it to white, and we're good to go, easy peasy. It, it's just a simple tool to help make this make the process of looking at your map simpler. Yeah, so um, you know we've heard a lot of customers that maybe share workspaces um, and just want to be able to easily highlight, or they're just working with a lot of different data layers and they just want to organize it a little bit better. Um, on that same note, we also have a recent addition, not in this release, but maybe worth highlighting here. You can actually search the layer names in the control center. Um, I think if you right-click somewhere, I mean that search option should show up as well. Um, search layer descriptions so that that was another recent addition you can also use control f um, so if you are one of those users that has really big workspaces and, and you need trouble that that's another relevant tool here for just managing your data um, within, within the workspace oh, that's, all I <laughs> that's all. <laughs> a typo there but that's okay you get the yeah. idea <laughs> Um, exactly. Okay, so a couple of other things that we want to show here. Um, so we're going to take a look at some feature template options. No, um, you. Yep. Uh, took a minute for me to get the screen back there. So we're going to take a look at some new options for feature templates, um, including customizing the styles. Um, so let me bring up my workspace here. So I just have some imagery loaded here, um, nothing particularly spe special, but we're going to take a look at um, using feature templates to um, kind of improve data creation or, um, you know, attribute collection, um, whether that's, you know, digitizing, you know, creating new features, or if you're actually out in the field doing that data collection. So to access feature templates, I want to go to the configuration, and we have a category here for feature templates. I've started to build one here that we're going to go ahead and add to. Um, so we can create these feature templates now by the vector type. So for points, lines, or areas. Um, in this example, we're going to take a look at um, creating a feature template for cr collecting information about trees, so a tree inventory. Um, and I started to set this up just to save a little bit of time here, but let's go ahead and edit it. So I have a tree inventory here. Um, just given my template a name, and I've added a couple of attributes here. Um, so the first attribute that I want here is just manually entering the species name. I've made that not required, partly because I don't know from my aerial imagery here. Maybe I'm going to save that for being filled in later, but I do want to include that attribute in every feature. Um, but I did not make a value required. Um, and then we have a couple of numeric attributes. So we've set these up as floating point attributes so that they'll be allowing integer precision here. Um, so when you enumerate these values, you have the option to change the data type. This was a recent, recent addition. So you can customize you know, whether that value needs to be a string, which would be you know, letters, or an, an, an integer or floating point you know, decimal number. Um, so that will you know, not allow the user to finish that feature if it doesn't match that particular data type. Um, you can also have a Boolean attribute, so just yes or no, um, kind of binary zero one um, attributes. Um, so I've set up a couple that are numeric. Um, so dbh and height are two attributes that I might want to collect out in the field as I'm doing this tree inventory survey. I'm going to add one more attribute here that is going to control my style. Um, so this is one of the new features that we've added. So I want to add a style mapped attribute. I'm going to use the button here. Um, this is going to be my um, type here. And I want to differentiate whether these trees are um, evergreen or um, deciduous. So just a basic categorization here. But I want to use my, my point icon to represent that as I place features um, on the map. So this is going to be string because I'm just entering a um, you know, a, 
description here and I can set up my values here. So deciduous is one of the attributes that I want to use. I have gone ahead and pre-built a couple of um, feature types using a custom icon. So tree is already built in and it does look like a, um, a conifer or a, an evergreen tree here. Um, I've added my own custom style here for deciduous trees. And um, so I did set that up ahead of time. Um, I'll show you what that looks like um, after we after we finish this template here. Um, and I want to add a second one here, which is um, we'll call it evergreen. And we'll go ahead and use that default tree icon for those ones. So I have two possible attributes, just keeping this simple here. Um, so two, two possible values for my type attribute and um, and then custom styling that's going to be associated based on what I choose as I'm creating my data. Um, so this value is editable. The user can choose what this input is, and it is also a required feature. So when I'm creating this data within this, this layer using the template, um, I'm going to be required to pick one of these two um, before continuing. I also, um, I think this we've recently improved this as well. I, I didn't choose a default value in this case. Um, that's just a little bit cleaner, making sure that, that the user explicitly picks the correct value. But if I wanted to, I could you know, presume that most of these trees are um, evergreen and just set that as the default if I wanted to. Um, so that's all we'll do for our kind of template setup here, just to keep things simple. So I just have four attributes that I'm including, um, three of which are required and a few different options in terms of how we've set that up. So lots of flexibility here in terms of um, the data type and um, you know what, what is required and what is optional values here. So that's the template. I'll show you quickly before we add features here that I did make a custom style ahead of time. So if I go to my styles, um, I made a new type and I loaded a custom point symbol here. Um, so that's what we're gonna see. So I did set that up um, ahead of time. You can always come back here and then go back and modify your feature template to use particular styles as well. Um, so now we want to use this feature template just to see how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and create in my existing workspace here an empty template layer. And we'll just call it trees. So now I'm going to use the digitizer tool. And let's see if we can locate one of these trees here. So the first thing I need to do to make sure that this template is applied is to make sure that I'm putting it in the layer that is using the template. And you'll notice that now my attributes have been filled out. So I can modify the attributes here if I want to, um, or I can click OK and any of the required values are actually going to pop up and require that I finish filling them in before I create the feature. And so I'm just going to do it that way. So we'll say that the DBH is three. I'm not a forester, so I'm not sure about these exact values here and we'll see that the height is 12. This is a pretty tall tree and this one looks like it's probably deciduous so we'll go ahead and choose that attribute um, and now that tree feature has been created. We'll do one more here. Um, I think this is leaf off so we can maybe assume that this one is a conifer. So we'll just enter a few more values here and this one we will make um, evergreen. So you'll see Maybe a bit hard to see on the screen here with the imagery, but I'll turn that off. Um, those icons, those styling have been custom added based on that attribute that I set up as my style attribute. Um, so those are new options. And again, that will translate to the mobile application as well. Um, so that's another way to set styles, custom um, point styles in the mobile application. If you are sending people out in the field to do this inventory, you know, actually out in the field using their um, iOS or Android device, um, using your packages that you've sent to them that contains this template. We did have a question come in. Someone wants to know if it's possible to share these feature templates. Yeah, so um, you can share a workspace that includes a template um, or a package, so a, a GMP or a GMMP. Um, GMMP would be for the mobile device, and that will include the template as long as it's in the workspace when you export it. Um, you just need to add that template layer to the workspace. Um, and again, customizing styles. So uh, if we have a question about that, I'll just go 
into that a little bit more. Um, so I can make a new custom type and give it a custom style. So you know maybe I want to do another another tree type here. Um, you can load custom point symbols. You can also customize these pre-built shapes. Um, you know so if you want to customize a dot, for example, and give it particular attributes, um, you can go ahead and build some custom symbols as well. Um, we'll just call this tree three. Um, so lots of options for customizing what those styles are. Um, that works with areas and lines as well. Um, or if you want to load, as I did, load a custom icon. Um, I think I just created this in, in Paint just to quickly have something here, but there are lots of um, icon resources out there um, as well. Um, so yeah, that's how you can customize your template. Um, great, so that is some improvements that we've made to feature templates here. So that could be pretty powerful for you know collecting data um, either just when you're digitizing, making it easier to fill in all those attributes, or um, also out in the fields. We have a bit of time left here. So a couple of other features that I want to show you. Um, we're going to take a look at um, using the info tips to look at the elevation neighborhood. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. I'm just going to go back to this workspace that I had here with some terrain data loaded. Um, so we have a new option with InfoTips to show additional elevation information. So if you're not familiar with InfoTips, um, let's take a look at them. So let's go into configuration. This is in the view menu. Um, and what InfoTips can do is show a little text pop up that gives you more information about um, the data that your cursor is hovering over. And so it's going to automatically pop up when you're not moving the mouse um, and show you that additional information. And the two options that I have checked here now um, are some of the new features here. So I can show the, um, I've always been able to show the elevation at the location of my cursor. Um, but what is new here is actually showing the neighborhood around my cursor as well. Um, you know, so when you're doing terrain editing, like, like with terrain painting or, you know, maybe doing um, cut and fill volume calculation or looking at slopes and you want to know, um, you know, where that slope exactly breaks. Um, this might be relevant here to see that whole neighborhood of pixels here. So let's enable the info tips in the view menu now that they've been configured. And you'll notice as I put my cursor over the map and let's actually go somewhere where there's a bit of a cliff here. Um, so you'll notice that I can see uh, the neighborhood of pixels around where my cursor is. So the height value that's being reported at the end there is um, interpolated based on my exact cursor location. So it might not be, my cursor might not be exactly in the center of the pixel. And if it's not, that's gonna be slightly different than what's in the middle of my grid here. Um, and then I have this three by three grid that's showing me the exact pixel values in my raw data um, around where my cursor is. So that's giving me lots of detailed information. Um, you know, if I wanna do some terrain, manipulation or if I'm just looking at slope calculation, things like that. Um, if you're not familiar with using slope in Global Mapper, let's take a look quickly here at the slope shader. Um, you know, so this might show me, I can see that particular break and just exactly how the elevation values are changing um, as that slope changes. So that's info tips, which is a um, new option to include that three by three elevation neighborhood. Um, we're reaching the end here, but a few other things that I'm going to show before we wrap up here. Um, let's see, I think I have some LiDAR data loaded quickly here. So we've added an easier way to get to metadata information. Um, this is relevant for vector data as well, but perhaps most relevant for LiDAR data. So that's the sample that I have loaded here. Um, if I'm using the info tool, I can find out information about a particular point feature. Um, what we've added is an easy way from there to actually get to the metadata for the entire layer. So particularly with LiDAR data, um, you know, I might be looking at particular attributes of this feature, density, um, you know, certain things that are part of the data or that have been calculated by Global Mapper and sort of added here. Um, but you know, I might need to know about the context of the, that. So now from the info tool, I can easily get to the metadata as well and maybe look at these side by side and compare easily, for example, here. The overall point cloud point density to my particular density of the feature that I have selected. Um, 
you know, or I might want to maybe looking at the class and I want to compare it to the overall class categories, etc. Um, but it's nice to have those two easily accessible next to each other between looking at individual feature information and also looking at, um, you know, the overall metadata of the layer. Um, you can also attach graphs to features. Um, this isn't necessarily relevant with LiDAR data, but there are some improvements there. Um, in addition to the layer graphing that we covered earlier, um, you can actually do multiple attributes within a particular individual feature. Um, so let's take a look at that quickly. And I'm just going to go back to my vector data here. Um, so if I use the info tool on one of these counties, um, I want to maybe create a graph that actually shows multiple attributes here. So I don't want to show just confirmed cases, but I also want to show some of the other attributes. Um, so I'm looking at one county here, and let's make um, just make a bar graph here. In this particular case, I want to do multiple attributes. So um, not just the confirmed cases, but some of these other common statistics as well. Um, and we'll go ahead and graph this, each of the values here. Let's see, we want to set this up. Um, I think I picked a county with very few cases here, so we're not seeing good data here, but let's change our feature and we'll, we'll get some better values here. Just gonna orient my data here. So now I'm actually, graphing multiple different attributes. Um, for the topmost lit feature here. Um, so that's going to generate a graph. In this particular case, it's not very interesting. That will actually be remembered across all the features. So let's close this and look at um, a feature that actually has more interesting data here. And we can open that same graph here um, and get that data. So it's kind of a template. And you can generate that graph for each of the selected features. Um, so for each feature, I could look at, you know, these multiple attributes on this particular date. Um, this is going to be just looking at my top lowest, topmost layer right now. So just the April 1, which is what's on top right now, um, attributes. But um, I've made sort of a, a template for looking at multiple attributes for one individual feature. And I can generate that for each of my features using the info tool. So that was also a graph, a new graph addition there to do multiple attributes. Um, but again, it just uh, it just works in the context of one feature, so you actually access it through the feature info tool. Um, the last thing that I want to quickly show here um, before we wrap up is some new options for um, creating vector features. Um, let's go back to the Atlas shader here. Um, so we had some requests around this for just customizing the location and the vertices more easily. Um, so this works with all the vector types here, but if I go ahead and create a new point feature here, you'll notice that now right away I have access to controlling the location. Um, so we do have a tool buried in the digitizer called point at position where you can start with manually entering the position, um, but we've also added access to it this way. So once you add your feature, you might want to come in and customize those coordinates, um, you know, make sure that they're aligning exactly where you expected them to. Um, so we've added this new ability to access this before you fully created your feature. Um, this also works with, name my layer here. Um, this also works with line features. So, you know, I might create a line feature and right from the get go, I know that I want to, for example, add the, the height values from my terrain. So I can come right in and automatically add that, turn it into a 3D feature right away, um, you know, customize the slopes. There's lots of options in here. Um, you know, for, for modifying these uh, vertex properties or 3D vertex properties, um, adding timestamps, et cetera. So I can get right into that as I'm creating my feature. I don't have to come back to it once the feature's already created. Um, so just we've improved the access to that as well for creating new features um, and editing those vertices. So that's going to wrap us up for today. Um, so thanks for joining us. Um, if you have questions about um, licensing, you can contact orders at bluemarblegeo.com. Um, if you're watching the recording of this or if we didn't get a chance to fully answer your question, you can always contact us for technical support questions at geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. Um, you can go to our website to request a free trial of the software. This is 
global member 22.1. Um, if you purchased within the last year and you have maintenance and support, then you should automatically get this version of the software. Um, just covering that as well. Um, also, a reminder to stay tuned next week for the webinar on the ladder module and what's new in the ladder module um, with this release. Um, so thanks, thanks very much, Amanda, for joining me. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for attending.